In the aftermath of World War II, Japan was left smoldering from the bombing campaigns launched by the U.S. during the war. With masses of unemployed former soldiers wandering the streets and the country in near famine conditions for years, by 1949, the government found the perfect way to employ the former soldiers, creating the government-run Japanese National Railway. They placed longtime rail bureaucrat Shimoyama Sadanori as the organization's head in June of 1949. Just over a month later, he would go missing, and his body would be found on the rail tracks the following day. A series of train derailments followed in quick succession, and investigations never seemed to find out exactly what happened, instead creating a web of conspiracy theories ranging from the Japanese Communist Party, or perhaps even the American occupation authorities themselves. After World War II, Japan was occupied by the U.S. and created the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, also known as SCAP, to oversee the occupation of Japan. For the vast majority of its existence, SCAP was controlled by Douglas MacArthur. And while the Japanese government was largely left intact, SCAP had a wide range of controls over Japanese society and possessed an overall ability to just lean on the Japanese government to get things done. The U.S. essentially wrote the post-war Japanese constitution, pushed through land reform, and oversaw a total remaking of the Japanese educational system, among other things. Though, things weren't perfect in the country. Hunger was rampant, and most of the country had been burnt up via the bombing campaigns, and there was a general sense of disorder during the time. There were numerous terrible murders in the country. Chinese, Korean, and Taiwanese people were there, who had either come of their own free will or had been imported as slave labor. And naturally, they were still angry at the Japanese who had done that to them but they had yet to be sent home, and so they had to live alongside the Japanese for the time being. The Koreans, in particular, had a number of outspoken communists in their ranks, and often battled the police. And, of course, corruption scandals plagued the Japanese government at the time, with major scandals breaking out at a rate of more or less one per year. To describe Japan at that time as a dumpster fire would perhaps be too polite. It was like a nuclear bomb had went off. Because, well, it did. Strikes, of course, were something that people had to deal with, and one of the largest labor unions in the country, the National Railway Workers Union, was more than willing to strike. Though it was quite prone to infighting, it was primarily under the influence of the Japanese Communist Party. The railway network in Japan was so vital and so important for the economy, and the Railway Workers Union so large, encompassing 96% of all railway workers, that the union could bring the country to a standstill. Initially, this wasn't the problem for MacArthur or SCAP. In fact, one of the first things that MacArthur did when he got to Japan was release the leaders of the Japanese Communist Party. In the lead up to and during the war, the Japanese Communist Party had most of its leadership locked away and they bled numbers during that time period. After the war, however, things couldn't be further from that. While they were not the most institutionally powerful political group on the Japanese left, at the time, they held a strong influence in the country from the pro-communist Korean organizations as well as its ties to organized labor. And even more than that, they had the protection of MacArthur and SCAP, for a while anyway. In return, the JCP held a firmly pro-Soviet and pro-American viewpoint, holding up MacArthur and the Americans as liberators to the Japanese people. So strong was the respect for MacArthur that in 1947, when they had planned to use a general strike to knock down the Yoshida Shigeru government, MacArthur ended up ordering the strike not go on, and the JCP's labor representative tearfully announced that the general strike would be cancelled. But between the incident with the general strike and the general reverse course that MacArthur was taking as the Cold War intensified, it ended up leading to confrontation and eventually MacArthur would turn totally against the left-wing elements in the lead-up to the creation of the Japanese National Railway. The Japanese government created a law which forbade employees of government-owned operations from striking. The National Railway Workers Union had been legally muzzled and couldn't take action, and so naturally, they weren't happy about that. The following year, on June 1st, 1949, the Japanese National Railway was created formally. The unassuming bureaucrat, Shimoyama Sadanori, was selected as its head. He had a lot on his plate. The Dodge Line, an economic policy set towards stopping the runaway inflation in the country, meant that the Japanese National Railway was going to have to cut a lot of jobs. The month after his appointment, on July 5th, 1949. At 7.20 a.m., he left for work in his official Buick from Ota Ward and went off to the Mitsukoshi department store in Nihonbashi. When he arrived, the store was closed 
so he directed his chauffeur to go to the bank across from the JR building in Shiyoda, then went back to the Mitsukoshi department store by 8.37 a.m. He told his driver that he would be in Mitsukoshi for five minutes and then return. He never returned to his Buick. Every morning he met with his secretary in the JR building, so news of his disappearance spread quickly and in tandem with the already tense atmosphere about the job cuts meant that the police were called for almost immediately. The police searched everywhere around the department store, including the far-off Asakusa station. There, people stated that they had seen Shimoyama. One person who had seen Shimoyama in the department store described him as being surrounded by three or four men and walking somewhere. Later, a ticket checker at Gotana Station in Adachi Ward stated that he saw a man who looked like Shimoyama. The man had asked if he knew the location of a nearby hotel to which the man suggested one. However, the man that the ticket checker saw didn't use the preferential path that Shimoyama would have had as the head of JR. Others stated that they saw a man who looked like Shimoyama walking around in the vicinity of that hotel, walking around nervously, but not smoking, and later removing both his necktie and glasses. Shimoyama smoked regularly and needed his glasses to see. That and other descriptions of the man have led some to posit that perhaps this was a body double. His wife that day, for her part, also stated that it could have been a suicide. At about 12.24 a.m. the following day, on the 6th, the train for the day departing down the line from the Kita Senju Station to ISA Station was driving down the track almost completely in the dark because their main light wasn't working. When they reached the rail overpass from where Gotano Station's line crossed over the Kita Senju ISA line, one of the engineers realized that they had ran over a body. They stopped the train and called the authorities. Shortly thereafter, the police arrived and confirmed that the body was Shimoyama's. The man leading the autopsy was Tokyo University professor Furuhata Tanimoto. Furuhata had proven himself at an early age with his research into blood types. However, he was also tied to numerous cases of wrongful convictions. And he really went above and beyond to do this, going as far as to use mathematical equations to try and prove someone is guilty. Furuhata stated that Shimoyama's body had no vital reaction to the train running him over. So in his mind, Shimoyama had already been dead by the time the train had run him over suggesting that he had been murdered. Another medical professional from the Tokyo Medical Examiners disagreed. The other professor noted that certain parts of the body appeared to have a vital response consistent with being run over, and the rain at the site meant that the actual amount of blood that could be found at the scene was going to be unknown. A further professor from Keio University, also in Tokyo, stated that the scene was consistent with suicide. However, the US also dispatched their own investigator, a man from the Army Counterintelligence Corps who, for the first time, used luminol in a Japanese criminal investigation. It detected only small amounts of blood on the rails, and so it became a big argument between the different camps. Asahi Shimbun journalist Yara Kimiyo, who was one of the first on the scene, described the body being covered in quote-unquote Shimoyama oil, and that strange oils covered his body except for his shoes. To him it seemed deeply unnatural and strange, leading him to become one of the major proponents of the murder theory stating that these oils were potentially from the place that Shimoyama had previously been murdered at. A second luminol test showed that there were further bloodstains up the tracks, not far from where Shimoyama had been hit. By the embankment, there was a dilapidated building alongside the tracks, and there, further testing showed large amounts of blood in the building. The police had tracked down the owner, and he stated that the blood was his, as a result of an accident with a hatchet. Blood tests, however, proved inconclusive, and ultimately, no one was sure what to make of it, and even to this day, no one's really sure what the hell happened. But while the investigation of Shimoyama continued, there were other incidents that were just waiting to happen. Just 10 days after Shimoyama's disappearance, an unmanned train with its dead man switch tied down plowed into Mitaka Station in Tokyo, killing six men instantly and wounding an initial 20 people. The crash was less than 15 miles away from Shimoyama's body. Investigators theorized that it could be the result of sabotage by the Japanese Communist Party, and their investigation was quick to continue on those lines. Not long after, they arrested 11 people, 10 JCP members who were working for JR, and the non-political former employee, Takeuchi Keisuke. Takeuchi was placed under arrest by the police and confessed to being the sole perpetrator. One of the communists was let go based on his alibi, and the nine others were also not prosecuted because of Takeuchi's confession. And so Takeuchi was given a trial. Not a fair one, but a trial. You see, he had an alibi, that he was in the bath with a roommate of his. His defense never brought up that alibi, however, and never called his roommate as a witness. 
there was something fishy going on, particularly issues such as if the dead man's switch could actually be tied down with a cord that investigators thought it was, as well as claims that criminal-looking elements had left the station after the crash and began shouting that the Japanese Communist Party were at fault for what had happened there. There had also been a claim that an American jeep was seen absolutely flying away from the train station after the crash. Takeuchi also claimed that his lawyer promised him that if he took responsibility for the crime, he could be a hero to the party. But there's no hard proof for any of that. So the waters were only muddied further and further. He was given a life sentence rather than a death sentence. However, this was heavily criticized and on appeal was elevated to a death sentence. All throughout his imprisonment, Takeuchi continued to protest his innocence and continued his legal battle. However, in 1963, he died of brain cancer. And now, a little bit over a month after the Mitaka incident, in a small town called Matsukawa, there was yet another derailment. This one was different from the prior derailment. Instead of someone tying down the dead man's switch, the track itself was sabotaged. When the train reached the point of sabotage, it derailed and collapsed, killing three crewmen of the engine. Along the rail where the crash occurred, the fish plates connecting the rails together had been removed, and the cross ties had their nails pulled out. But to top that, a single rail of 25 meters in length and 925 kilos in weight had been removed and moved 13 meters into the neighboring rice paddy. This wasn't the work of one man, nor even a pair of men, but a team of men. They would have had to lift and move a nearly 2,000 pound rail over 40 feet across the bush, over the ditch, across the road, and then into the rice paddy here. Because of the two prior incidents in quick succession, the Matsukawa incident quickly attracted public attention, and public opinion placed them together as a string of incidents. The government itself described these incidents as being from the same, quote, ideological undercurrent, with the obvious implication that these were communists who were doing these things. In this case, too, police from the beginning had decided that the communists had done this and set out to look for them. They identified a 19-year-old who had been previously arrested for rape, some contend that the rape was fictional, and afterwards they wrapped him up in the investigation and got a confession out of him. News of this spread fast. After that, a group of 19 men, either National Railway Union members or employees of a local factory union, were arrested. A woman was also arrested in connection with the incident, with the crime of creating an alibi for the men. But before long, eight of those 20 and the original 19-year-old had all confessed, and from their confessions, the story of the derailment was created. And at the first trial, all who confessed were very quick to recant, and there had been no physical evidence tying them to the crime, but still, the trial went ahead anyway, and as a result, in 1950, five men had been given the death sentence, five had been given a life sentence, and the rest had received prison sentences ranging from 15 years to just over three years. This is far from the end of it, however, because neither this nor the previous Mitaka incident had quick legal battles. Though public opinion was on their side, the men had a rough road ahead. Help from the writer Hirotsu Kazuo and other intellectuals helped, but it wasn't enough to save them fully, with the 1953 appeal trial only freeing some of the men. It wasn't until 1959 that the Japanese Supreme Court heard the case and sent it back to the original court based on the fact that one of the accused alibi had been suppressed. There, they received in this verdict. And ultimately, after the Matsukawa incident, things stopped. That was it. There were no more derailments for the time being. Just as soon as it had begun, it had ended. But the more one digs into these incidents, the more questions you end up with. And I would know, not just as a fan of history, but as a fan of history of this period, and as somebody who made a chart for every train accident in Japan from 1940 to 1954. So, who the hell did it? Commonly referred to as one of the worst intelligence chiefs in U.S. Army history, Charles A. Willoughby's reputation towers over these incidents. A naturalized German who had served in the U.S. Army since World War I, MacArthur jokingly referred to him as his pet fascist. He's featured prominently in pretty much every conspiracy theory about the occupation of Japan. His official title was the head of G2 in SCAP, which was the wing that enforced the press code for Japan, but also as an intelligence gathering unit. G2 and another group inside of SCAP, GS, government section, were often at odds with one another. GS and its two prominent faces, Courtney Whitney and Charles Louis Cades, were progressive and largely backed New Deal style programs and reform. GS essentially drafted and dictated the post war Japanese constitution, for example. And while GS provided support for progressive politicians, G2 
much rather preferred the strongly pro-American Yoshida Shigeru. As tensions with the Soviet Union ratcheted up and the reverse course began, GS became alienated from SCAF's leadership and G2 became more powerful. Now, G2 and Willoughby have been accused of many, many things, but let's talk about what he actually did, because it's pretty f***ing awful. Willoughby had some level of respect for Japan, probably as a result of being semi-fluent in the language, purportedly. Willoughby was a strong supporter of increasing the Japanese police force's strength, which it probably needed, but at the same time he fought very hard to get certain Class C and Class B war criminals off the hook, though he also worked to get major political criminals who were politically connected, Sasakawa Ryoichi and Kodama Yoshio, out of trouble. Kodama himself would carve out a special niche as the mediator for criminal groups in the country, and would act as sort of a fixer and bagman of many deals. But far, far worse than that, Willoughby was deeply involved in getting immunity for Ishi Shiro, the head of Unit 731 and all of Japan's overall biological warfare and human experimentation divisions of the Japanese Imperial Army. Under Ishii's instruction, human experimentation of various diseases, such as the bubonic plague, typhus, lockjaw, syphilis, and so on, was undertaken. They also engaged in mass rape, random visit section, even on Japanese guards, and engaged in numerous human experimentations that essentially had no real value. There's a lot more to it, but given the fact that they recorded many of their human experiments, there's really a limit to how much I can take, so we'll stop right there. But suffice to say, this guy who Willoughby had gotten off really deserved to be killed. To put it lightly, Willoughby was a malevolent force, and he was also just bad at his job in general, and his bad intelligence caused the US much consternation during the Korean War. However, arguably the biggest and most important, at least in this situation, incident that Willoughby was tied to was the Cannon Group, or Z Group. Z Group was headed by Jack Y. Cannon, and acted as a secret intelligence gathering and counterintelligence outfit based in the former Mitsubishi mansion in Tokyo. Though only consisting of 26 members, the group maintained close connections and provided work for various surreptitious groups in Japan. Given the large number of former soldiers, it made them perfect to use for Z-Unit's intelligence gathering activities. However, in 1951, the group fouled up real bad and managed to destroy Z-Unit and G2. Kaji Wataru had been a rather well-known writer and political activist, having taken part in student communist movements before ultimately being arrested and imprisoned and then undergoing an ideological conversion there, as many communists were at the time. After his release, he made his way to China and worked as a leader organizing Japanese POWs into anti-state psychological warfare forces. Once the war was over, however, he remained unaligned to Japanese political parties. He was suffering tuberculosis at the time, and after 1947, he essentially remained outside of politics, at least from what it seemed. As part of his recuperation plan from tuberculosis, Kaji often took regular walks along the railroad tracks by his home. While taking one of these walks, one morning, a jeep filled with American soldiers pulled up behind him and hit him on the head and kidnapped him. Kaji was kept underneath the Mitsubishi mansion and thereafter his prison changed repeatedly. He was questioned often about his activities and if he was a Soviet spy and if he could become a double agent for the US. Twice during his imprisonment, he attempted to commit suicide, but still, he was kept imprisoned. Eventually, a guard, a Japanese man employed by the Z unit, felt pity for him and put him in contact with his family. Shortly after, his family contacted the police, began to demand his release, and the press, naturally under the influence of G2, were forbade from speaking on the incident. As a result, the incident remains relatively unknown in Japan and totally unknown in the US. Eventually, he was released in central Tokyo about a year after his initial kidnapping and he was ultimately compelled to testify in the Japanese diet. There, through the testimony of others, it was revealed that Kaji had for some time apparently been an American agent, and he had started to get closer to the Soviets with the passage of time, and as a result of that, had been kidnapped. Though the incident today remained relatively unknown, it was the death knell for Z unit, and when Willoughby transferred out of the country to Korea in 1951, G2 was no longer a major force in the country. I really love Japanese history, especially the post-war history, because a lot of it comes off as some sort of like unhinged spy novel. Half real, half rumor, who even knows what's true. But more importantly, would Willoughby be someone who could derail trains to slander the Japanese Communist Party? Yes, but there is some issue with proving it. You see, the title for the mysteries themselves is the three great Japanese national railway mysteries, or the Kokutetsu-san Dai Mystery Jiken, but there are far more than two derailments. 
is a wheel chart that I made comes in handy. The narrative for the Willoughby argument is this, that G2 and Willoughby, having been empowered by the reverse course, began to involve themselves in the attempted destruction of organized labor in the Japanese Communist Party. Two, the constant strikes in Japanese railways proved to be a major issue for the country, and the deep involvement with the Japanese Communist Party was a serious concern for Willoughby and SCAP. Three, that the sudden increase in seats for the Japanese Communist Party in the 1949 House of Representatives election frightened Willoughby and SCAP. Four, for the sake of cracking down on both organized labor and the growing Communist Party, that a series of incidents be staged to cast blame on the JCP and unions. Five, the first president of JNR, Shimoyama, was either murdered for the U.S. for refusing to go along with demands for large-scale firings required by the Dodge Line, or killed himself as a result of the demands for them. The most glaring issue with this line of thought is that the modus operandi for the Matsukawa incident happened in two prior derailments. The Yosan Line incident down in Shikoku's Ehime Prefecture had the same method of its creation and occurred three months prior to the Matsukawa incident, meaning it didn't get any major coverage. But even more damning was the Niwasaka incident. It had the same modus operandi, and it occurred before the Dodge Line, before the elections of 1949, and it occurred months before the anti-strike bill was even announced, back in April of 1948. It was the first suspicious derailment in post-war Japan. It also occurred in the neighboring town to Matsukawa, Niwasaka. That's too coincidental. The Matsukawa modus operandi had to be connected in some kind of way. Unfortunately, the two prior cases give very little information to work off of. The earliest incident, the Niwasaka incident, provided absolutely no information at all. The Yosa Line incident, however, is a little bit more fruitful. The tools used there were not tools used by Japanese government railroads. Additionally, it appeared that a U.S. Army boot print was on one of the cross ties. The one individual was brought in for questioning relating to the incident, a Japanese man, killed himself via poison while in custody. So elements of the Willoughby theory are clearly wrong or misunderstanding things. It doesn't seem like the election in 1949 was much of a motivating factor if these were done by G2. Additionally, if they really wanted to crack down on the communists, why didn't they more thoroughly spread the news of the other two incidents with the Matsukawa modus operandi? The great national fever over the train mysteries happened after the Shiroyama incident, meaning that the Yosai line and the Iwasaka incidents got very little press coverage by comparison. Now, as far as the Shiroyama incident is concerned, there are no good explanations for anything. It's too much of a mess, and the evidence is not really all that trustworthy, and probably couldn't be called evidence anyway. Evidence suggesting murder and suicide uh, both exist and both seem to contradict each other, so we're never getting an answer for what happened to Shimoyama. Ultimately, I think it's fair to say that there's not enough proof connecting Willoughby, SCAP, or G2 directly to the derailments or Shimoyama. All there is is one boot print and claims of an American Jeep after the Mitaka incident. That's precious too little evidence considering the scale of the destruction. And if it wasn't Willoughby or SCAP, was it perhaps the Union and the Communist Party? The argument for the JCP or Union being behind the derailments isn't particularly advanced. This is because very few people back the police theories from back then about the derailments being tied to the JCP. Most of these cases had communists being targeted simply for the sake of being communists, usually based on scant or false evidence, and then they were sometimes compelled into confessing a common problem for the Japanese police force at the time. I mean, really, think about it. Most of the people who died or were wounded in these incidents, the Mitaka incident excluded, were actually railway workers. Most of the railway workers, as I've mentioned before, were union members, meaning that many times the people getting hurt in these incidents were members of the Union themselves. It's really impossible to claim that the Japanese Communist Party did the majority of the derailments, and potentially not even any of them. But there are still questions and further incidents for us to look at. On July 11, 1950, a little over a year since the Shimoyama incident, another intentional train accident occurred in Mitsuseki Station in northern Japan. As a freight train passed by the station, it switched over into the safety riding and derailed. Within the month, the police had determined that it was not an accident, but had rather been done on purpose by a former workman who was recommended a sentence of 15 years. The following year in 1951, up in Hokkaido near Sapporo, another train derailed. What was unique was that it also featured use of the Matsukawa modus operandi. Kind of. Rail fish plates had been removed, and the rail had been moved about four centimeters. The crash only wounded one engineer. About 600 railway workers, Japanese Communist Party members, were investigated, but ultimately no one was charged. 
This was followed up by the Aomei incident, which occurred at Ozaku Station in Tokyo. Four freight cars suddenly started to move forward and crashed into a sitting passenger train. No one was hurt. The cops rounded up 10 Communist Party members, and I'm sure you know the pattern by now. They were all arrested, and then they went through some trials, and then eventually they were ultimately, finally, found innocent. In 1968, these train derailments were all very different from the other ones, which is probably why they didn't get any attention. Firstly, and this is the big one, they didn't kill anybody. Only the Marima Go incident wounded anybody. That's the one up in Sapporo. Secondly, they were potentially JCP or union related. This is because of a major policy change in the JCP. In the wake of the Korean War, the party was heavily criticized by Stalin and Mao, demanding that they be proactive and revolutionary. As a result, the majority wing led by party leader Tokuto Kyuichi began to plan and advocate for an armed revolution in Japan. Numerous violent incidents caused by the JCP occurred, and ultimately Tokuto fled into exile. The party wasn't able to recover from the damage to its reputation until the 1970s. The first incident, the Mitsuseki incident, where the former worker got 15 years, could potentially be a case where a man was wrongfully convicted, or it could have been a JCP or union member who got a little bit ahead of himself. Though this incident occurred a little bit early and before a large-scale criticism of the Japanese Communist Party. So it's hard to say with this one, but I suspect it was potentially a wrongful conviction. Then there's the Marimogo derailment, which occurred near Sapporo. Despite ostensibly following the Matsukawa modus operandi, this one is one that I think the JCP might have actually caused the derailment in if there was any that they did do. The Marimogo incident was a weak attempt to mimic the Matsukawa modus operandi, which by that point was known by the public. However, only moving the rail three centimeters suggests perhaps a lack of time or manpower. This likely wasn't the same people involved with the Matsukawa incident. Another notable point was that Sapporo's JCP branch was actually quite radical. They were involved in a number of incidents, including an incident where they shot a detective to death. Even with all that, it still remains conjecture and we'll never know. So there's no conclusion. Not really. There's no real good answer for any of this. Many of the people who are in the know, so to speak, usually dive on in head first with the Willoughby Scap Theory. Some of this is as the result of a quote-unquote non-fiction book entitled Black Fog Over Japan by detective fiction writer Matsumoto Seicho. Published at a height of anti-Americanism in the country, 1960, Matsumoto's first book blurred the lines between fiction and outright conspiracy theorism. Basically, in Matsumoto's fictional account, the U.S. was involved in basically anything bad that happened in Japan post-1945. In fact, the U.S. was even blamed in his book for starting the Korean War. Essentially, it was an anti-American propaganda novel, and it was a bestseller. Now, in the novel, there was also a focus on domestic corruption, of which there was plenty to choose from, I assure you. But essentially, the book was half narrative and half political argument. Remember, at the time, many of these cases were still working their way through the courts. And as far as intentional derailments go, things just kind of stopped. Of course, the trials went on and on, but the train derailments stopped. Over the years, the history has become muddled, and it's become harder and harder to separate fact from fiction. The passage of time has made it all too easy to construct a false narrative around it. And there's so many questions, it's incredible. It's down to the point that Shimoyama's dog is involved in the theories. Ultimately, I think it's fair to say that there was potentially more than one group involved in the train derailments from 1948 to 1952. But it's also important to remember that conspiracy theories thrive when we don't have all the information that we need. The human mind loves patterns and pattern recognition, and we ultimately desperately seek not just patterns, but also answers to questions. Another thing to consider is that potentially one of these incidents could have just been the handiwork of a lone criminal. But similarly, it's also important to remember that Japanese railroads in the post-World War II era were incredibly messed up. A lot of the mechanics of these cars and the rails themselves were neglected or made with substandard materials. So it's not exactly like the Japanese railroads were well-run or a well-oiled machine. There is a potential that one of these incidents could have actually been something not nefarious at all. Could have happened accidentally. But ultimately, we'll never know. Hey everybody, it's Charlie. I just wanted to take the time to thank everybody for watching the video. It took a lot of time and effort to make. And let's be honest, I probably didn't need to make a chart of all the train accidents from 1940 to 1954, but uh, you know, that's just how it is sometimes. Anyway, if you liked the video, make sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment if you have anything you want to add. Also, if you can, please share this video. It would help a lot. Also, check out this video. It's pretty good.
Good stories only. Thank you.